Master, the tempests are raging, the billows are blowing high, the sky is o'ershadowed with blackness, no shelter or help is nigh. Now that's how you start a song, hymn or otherwise. And in particular, that's how you start the, uh, the famous hymn, Peace Be Still. A hymn that I think is one of the most exceptionally uh, precious pieces of literature, pieces of poetry to come out of its time. Even though it is most famous because of the 1962 recording uh, of the Reverend James Cleveland, rightly so. It was actually written in 1874, I believe, just about nine years after the end of the Civil War by Mary Ann Baker. And I don't know a lot about Mary Ann Baker, but I know she's a heck of a poet. And when you combine her poetry with the arrangement and the style of James Cleveland, you have something really moving. Now, I'm not a religious channel, so I'm going to talk about this religious song, but I'm going to talk about it mostly in terms of what it means to me as a poem and uh, what it means to me, um, uh, I guess, just what it means to me and what it means to you, I'd love to know. Uh, especially for those of you who think I'm getting it completely wrong. Because when it comes to poetry and music, I often get it completely wrong. But what strikes me about Peace Be Still is the very first line. Master. That's the first word. Master, the tempests are raging. Now, the reason why that word strikes me is because this was a... Uh, this, this was written by a Christian poet, recorded by, obviously, a Christian minister. And Christians have a lot of ways of addressing God. For example, they may say God. They may say Lord. They might say Father, uh, Christ. They may, uh, they may refer to Christ's earthly given name of Jesus. Now, Master is a appropriate, but it is not very common. So of all of the words uh, and titles a person can use, when you say master, it's, it is immediately giving you a sense of urgency because you are removing any question of doubt in the relationship. You are coming as a complete supplicant. You are coming, you are coming with a plea, master. And then he tells you, because the tempests are raging. When James Cleveland sings this line, he has this great way of doing it. James, I, I did not study music or voice, so I don't know what are the proper words to describe James Cleveland's voice, um, but his voice has a certain gruffness and rawness to it that gives a lot of passion to everything he sings. But he almost forces that voice to softness when he says master. And it's just master. He just lays it like a supplicant laying a petition uh, at the altar. But then as soon as he does that, that softness goes away and the plea comes out. He says the tempest. And when he says tempest, he is, he's pushing his voice up to the sky. The tempest is raging. And every bit of self-control, every bit of calm, every bit of, 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 of whatever there was left of, of, of personal, uh, I don't want to say dignity, but of, but of personal composure, he could only get that into one word, master. And then it was gone, and he was just raw after that. The tempest are raging. It says the billows are tossing high. The sky is, is overshadowed with blackness. No shelter or help is nigh. Now this poem and song uh, is inspired by, and in fact some of it, some of the wording is directly lifted from, the King James Version of the Gospel according to St. Mark in the fourth chapter when the apostles are on the sea uh, and Jesus is asleep and a storm comes and they get scared because they think they're going to drown and Jesus is sort of, Jesus kind of, you know, comes to them. You get the sense that Jesus rolls his eyes a little bit as if to say, after everything we've been through, do you think, I, do you think I'm just going to leave you like this? Um, 
Now, I think about the poet. I don't know much about Marianne Baker, but I know that she was active in the temperance movement. So I think about that when I read the poem. I do not know a lot about James Cleveland, frankly. I know that he was a innovator in, in Christian music, particularly in the American black church. I know that, that sometimes uh, he, is, uh, he was sort of in between what you might have called the old school style and the new innovation of what would become contemporary Christian music. And sometimes when you're an artist that gets caught in between those times, uh, maybe, you get, maybe you get thought of as being old school and you don't get as much credit as being the innovator that you are. Uh, but regardless, there is something magical that happens with this song when you take her words and whatever inspired them and his voice and his arrangement and whatever inspired it and you put them together. It is absolutely incredible. There are 12 stanzas to this poem, and I'm not going to read them all, but I do want to read one more to you. Uh, it says, Master, with anguish of spirit, I bow in my grief today. The depth of my sad heart are troubled. Awaken and save, I pray. Now, in that first couplet, Master, with anguish of spirit, I bow in my grief today. That reminds me a little bit of Job. It's, it feels a little bit like that very moment when, when Job has just uh, basically written an indictment on God, and then God comes down and answers Job by questioning man. Job repents. And in that moment where Job felt the conviction that he was wrong to do what he did, it says, Master, the anguish of spirit, I bow in my grief today. I have to wonder if, they, if there wasn't a little bit of Job in that. Uh, it just makes me feel that way. The refrain throughout this song uh, and if, if you haven't guessed by me looking, I have, a, I have a copy of it here because I do not have all 12 stanzas committed to memory. Though when I'm singing it, I'm pretty good at faking it when I, when I, when I, if, if I've got somebody next to me who knows it really well. But the refrain from is, is Jesus' answer, the winds and the waves shall obey my will, peace be still. So throughout the song, even if this person is, is bringing forth their troubles and their fear, God, uh, Christ is, co is constantly there to reassure them, peace be still. I'm in control. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'm in control. Uh, at the very end, the last stanza that the narrator gives, now it ends with Christ getting the last with the master of the oceans, the earth and the skies, they shall obey my will, peace be still. But just before that, the, uh, the last stanza of the narrator is the only time the narrator does not call God master or call Jesus master. It says, linger, O blessed redeemer, leave me alone no more. And with joy, I shall make my blessed harbor and rest the blissful, excuse me, and rest on the blissful shore. So I get the sense that when, when this last when, the, when this last stanza is written, the idea is that they have found that peace. Because remember, I started this by talking about the urgency of saying master, and now he's calling him by another title, redeemer, which, is, which, is, uh, which fits the poem quite well, but also fits the idea that they've settled down a little bit. <laughs> maybe, maybe already we're getting too comfortable. Now, compare this song with another one of James Cleveland's great songs, uh, I Don't Feel No Ways Tired. Now, that song is far less complicated lyrically. Uh, it doesn't have as much going on, but it is not less complicated emotionally or even in the, in the quality of the message. I've been friendless, but God brought me I've been lonely, but God brought me. Please don't leave me, don't leave me, Jesus. Don't leave me, don't leave me, Lord. 
And the refrain is constantly, he brought me this far. I don't believe he brought me this far just to leave me. Now, we know the story behind this. This was written uh, by Curtis uh, Burrell. I don't, I'm not sure if I'm saying his right name, his name correctly. But he saw this after seeing an old woman. Uh, he, he witnessed an old woman uh, walking, and he tells the story. You can look it up. But here's the idea of somebody old, arthritic, arthritic, pain, has worked a lot of decades in her life, worked a lot of hours on that day, has a lot of walking to do to get home, just to rest, to walk a lot of miles back to work to do it again. But here, unlike uh, unlike Peace Be Still, which starts in the middle of the storm, I don't feel no ways tired, uh, starts with that phrase, I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. So here you see somebody taking almost a polar opposite view. Whereas the person in peace be still is scared to death and they can only get one word out before they start to fall apart. Here's a person who has faced the fire before. They've been in the storm before and they are saying, I know that, this, that, that there are troubles. Again, I see Job again here. Uh, I, see, I see Job all over this. Um, I may be wrong to see that, but I do. But in this, I see somebody who has, has, has aged. This isn't somebody better than, smarter than, more courageous than the people, than the, than the narrator of Peace Be Still. But this is someone who's already had their time in the, in, in the storm at sea. They had their faith tested and they have come out of it. And so now, yeah, it hurts. That it hurts. But I know that there's purpose to my life. I know there's dignity to my life. I sometimes think of um, Pope John Paul II, who had been such an athlete, uh, even into the early years of his papacy, but then sickness and disease crippled his body. And he allowed the whole world to watch him die, essentially, he, he, because he did not give up on the idea that a human being has dignity. Life matters. Even poor quality life is not to be taken for granted. So he walked until his legs could not support him, but he didn't hate his legs. He literally spoke until his lungs could not give out, could, could not uh, produce his voice. In fact, you can see that. You can Google John Paul II's last remarks and you'll see him trying to speak in front of a crowd until he can, he just collapses. And I think when I see that, I think of this song. Um, I ain't no, uh, excuse me, I, uh, I don't feel no ways tired. Now, there is one other thing I'd like to say about this. Um, the song is the, the title appears to be a double negative. Now, the way in which you might see this is that it was an older person who didn't particularly care about, the, 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 uh, about grammar all that much. They knew what they were saying. They knew you knew, knew what they were saying, and that's what they said. And that's probably correct. But it's also interesting to think that this person is, in a way, telling you that on some level, they are tired but not the way you think. My back hurts and my feet swell and my, my, my arthritis uh, could cripple my hands. You can hear the singer thinking or you can believe the singer's thinking. So yes, in that way, I am tired. But if you think I am too tired to take that next step, if you think I am too given out to go another day, if you think somebody calls on me but I can't answer, you're going to be wrong because in that way, I'm no ways tired. And I love that. And I love Peace Be Still. 
And if you haven't heard them, read them and then go and listen to them. Thank you.